Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 57th installment of the Seattle Metro Chamber's Executive Speaker Series. The purpose of these events is to highlight the different industries that are vital to our region. And as we progress now through the pandemic and the phases of reopening, the series will look at industries specifically through the lens of economic recovery after the pandemic. So today, our panel will discuss how retailers in our region have pivoted and innovated to keep their employees and customers safe this year and what they expect for the upcoming holiday season. Um, before we get going, I do have some webinar logistics to share with you. First of all, if you need any uh, technical support uh, or you have a question for a chamber staff during the webinar, please use the chat box down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you have a question for our speakers, though, we do ask that you use the Q&A box, which is separate. Um, that just lets us see all of the questions in one place and make sure we can keep track of them and get to everyone's question. Lastly, we will be recording today's webinar, um, and I will share that with all of you in a post-event email. So we wouldn't be here today without the support of our presenting sponsors, Advanced Professionals Insurance and Benefit Solutions and the Business Health Trust and our event sponsor, Bank of America. So I would like now to welcome Shannon Spencer, who's here on behalf of Advanced Professionals and BHT to turn on her video and share a few words with us. Thank you. Uh, like she said, my name is Shannon Spencer. I'm the Training and Advanced Events Manager for Advanced Professionals Insurance and Benefit Solutions which is the Wholesale Benefits Division of ABD Insurance and Financial Services. Uh, we help trade groups and other associations, such as the Seattle Chamber, provide health insurance and other employee benefits to small to mid-sized companies throughout the state. Uh, as a sponsor, I'm here today representing the Seattle Chamber's program, the Business Health Trust, which offers medical, dental, vision, and life insurance to chamber members. Uh, because we negotiate these benefits at a wholesale level, you can think of this like a Costco model, we are able to offer businesses with between anywhere between two to 199 employees with the kinds of prices and insurance plans that are more comparable to what larger companies have access to. This gives our region smaller companies additional negotiating power when they're trying to hire in our competitive job market. Um, my role here is to help you connect with our services and make you aware of the employee benefits available through your trust and membership. Again, my name is Shannon Spencer. I'm the Training and Events Manager for Advanced Professionals, here representing the Business Health Trust, which offers employee benefits to small and mid-sized companies that are members of the Seattle Chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. And thanks again to our sponsors. Uh, this series is not possible without their support. So let's get going, get to the meat of today's discussion. Um, I will start us off by introducing our moderator, John Engber. John is Washington Retail Association's contract lobbyist keeping track of legislative initiatives in Seattle, which often precedes similar statewide legislative efforts. He communicates with a coalition of Seattle businesses that could be affected by new laws and hears their concerns before working to negotiate terms with Seattle's elected officials. He's also the owner of John Ingber and Associates in Seattle. So with that, John, I will turn it over to you to get our panel discussion going. Great, thank you. And um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're really lucky to have such a terrific panel uh, with us today to share their insights and perspectives on what's going on with retail and grocery uh, sectors here in Seattle. Um, you know, at the start, I'd like to just state one sort of obvious thing, which is while this is a really distinguished panel, we're all sharing our own perspectives and thoughts and we don't speak on behalf of our entire industry. So, um, you know, that said, I'm, I feel we're really fortunate to have such a great panel with us today and I'm, I'm excited to hear what they have to say. Um, just one thought, and I, I think that many of you participating here today know this, that, that before this pandemic started, retailers and grocers faced a lot of challenges here in Seattle. You know, from public safety to organized retail theft to sometimes transportation and parking issues, um, uh, commercial rents, there are just a whole wide range of issues 
that impact uh, the ability of retailers and grocers to do business here. And um, some of those problems have been made worse by the pandemic, and most of them will be here after this pandemic is finally over. So, um, so I'm, I'm excited to hear what each of these panelists have to say to, to share with us about you know, how, they, how they do business in Seattle and, and how they see that playing out today and in the future. So with no further ado, um, and uh, my son just arrived. So if you hear some noise in the background, that's him. Um, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, Joan Geis is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Marketing in, and International Business at the Carson College of Business, Washington State University. She's also been on the marketing faculties of the University of Oregon, Kansas State University, and the University of Montana. Joan has published in several academic journals, including the Journal of Marketing, the Journal of Retail Psychology and Marketing, the Journal of Business Research, Marketing, Letters, and others. Um, she is also a marketing consultant to several businesses, agencies, and government organizations. Joan, thank you for joining us today. Sandy Lou Haler um, opened Sandy Lou, a boutique on First Avenue between Union and Pike in 2008. Before opening this boutique, Sandy maintained a welding jewelry art studio uh, located in the Soto area. Uh, it's now a warehouse for Sandy Lou. She and her husband, Harvey, raised a daughter and son in the Mount Baker neighborhood of Seattle, then moved to Pioneer Square in 2005. California native, uh, Sandy graduated from UC Berkeley. She relocated to Seattle in 1979 and has happily called this her home ever since. Thank you, Sandy. Denise Moraguchi is the president and CEO of Wajamaya, a family owned Asian specialty grocery retailer and wholesaler serving the Pacific Northwest since 1928. Denise's business background, along with her interest in carrying on her family legacy and ensuring Wajamaya's continued success, drove her to step forward as the third generation leader of her family business. Prior to joining Wajamaya, Denise worked in strategy consultant, consulting and brand management and received her MBA at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Denise is a strong supporter of Seattle's international district community, emeritus board member of the Denise Louie Education Center, and currently serves as the director for the Washington, as a director for the Washington State Convention Center and AAA Washington. She also enjoys spending time with her husband and their two children. Thank you, Denise. And then finally, uh, Tiffany Sanders is the corporate affairs manager for QFC. She is responsible for developing and implementing public affairs, uh, a public affairs strategic plan to enhance QFC's reputation and elevate unique stories. She also handles media relations and corporate giving as well as grant making. She's a good person to know. Um, before joining Kroger and QFC, Tiffany spent 20 years as a meteorologist and reporter in local television news. She worked, um, in uh, for CBS and Fox affiliates in Seattle, an ABC affiliate in Tucson and NBC in Tri-Cities. So she covered the, the specter of the broadcast uh, networks. She and her husband have been married for 24 years and enjoy spending time with her two children and two adorable dogs. Thank you for joining us today, Tiffany. Um, why don't we get started off, what I'd like to ask each of the panelists, Sandy, Denise, and Tiffany, is to briefly describe your organization and how the pandemic has affected your ability to do business here in Seattle. Want to start, Sandy? Sure. Well, I think that on, on this panel, no question that I represent truly the very small business as opposed to having a large, or, large organization. Before the pandemic, I had a total of five 
full-time employees. And then of course I have a team, right? I have uh, bookkeepers and accountant and, you know, um, a couple of advisors. When the pandemic hit, um, oddly, young women on my staff had made, we had all agreed to, they'd made some decisions. One's um, boyfriend uh, went to graduate school in Portland. A, a young woman who was with me for 12 years um, decided, you know, and I didn't blame her. Retail really wasn't her thing. So she left. So here's the interesting thing. Since, uh, since then, um, I've been running Sandy Lou myself and two part-time employees. It just sort of happened that way. It wasn't, it just happened. I think it's really interesting. The New York Times came out uh, today with an article about how the sectors that are affecting women the most are retail and um, service. And I think it's a very it's a thing where I have this little business and I speak to women across the country who every Monday who have little businesses and we all have our, our staffs have shrunk either because they've won't gone on to other things. They are afraid to come in or um, they, they cannot, the owners can't afford to pay them. So, you know, it's, it's pretty intense. I think for small, retailers uh, how to handle the, um, the employee thing. I also think that it's interesting that in downtown Seattle, 140 businesses have gone out of business. I mean, I think that was a chamber and DSA study. Um, and I think really now very small businesses like mine restaurants included and um, other kinds of retail. I think there's a certain amount of love for their city, in my case, love for Seattle, that causes you to try very hard to hang on in these very challenging times. Um, I didn't know if you wanted me to talk about pivoting or you wanna ask that later. Why don't we ask that later? Are you a, were you a non-essential retailer? Sandy, did you have to shut down for a while? Yes, oh yes. We shut down on uh, March 13th. And, um, and then I think, you know, this is kind of embarrassing. I more or less opened, I think around June 13th. I forget the ex exact day because it got Right, wavy. it was a fluid situation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Because um, our other two, um, our other two panelists, uh, their businesses stayed open as as grocers and as essential retailers. Oh yes, that's right. I forgot that aspect. Yep. Well, it was interesting. I also put on my um, website on my online shopping that we could not fulfill um, online orders during that time because we were not allowed to go into the shop. Right. I actually received a message from um, Governor Inslee that no, that really wasn't the case. Like we we could fulfill, we just couldn't let other people in there. Right. I thought that was pretty remarkable that they mm -hmm. told me. <laughs> yep. Okay, well, thank you, Sandy. Um, Denise, welcome. Um, why don't you share the perspective of how things have been going for Wajamaya during this these crazy times? Sure, well, thank you for having me and I'm happy to be here. Uh, for Wajamaya, we, I think most people know us as a grocery store and we definitely um, do operate four grocery stores, one in the Seattle's Chinatown International District. Um, and then we have Bellevue, Renton, and Beaverton, Oregon. Uh, so we have the grocery business, which John, you mentioned, is an essential business. And um, with more people working from home and eating at home, grocery sales have um, been pretty strong. Um, we also operate a restaurant delivery business um, through you know, part of our company. And we have some 
um, real estate. So we manage some buildings around the international district and parking lots. So it's been interesting because we've seen such a range of impacts. So some of our stores, uh, the ones outside of Seattle, kind of in the more neighborhood areas, so Bellevue and, and Renton and our Beaverton, those stores have seen strong sales. You know, people are staying home, they're shopping more, closer to home, eating more. So we've seen really strong sales growth there. Whereas um, our Seattle Chinatown International District store, you know, relies heavily on office workers, sports fans, tourists. Um, and we also happened to start a big remodel of that store in November, right before the pandemic. So if you went in, things were kind of torn up and it was a bit chaotic. So as a result, that store definitely um, has seen a lot of softness, which is a lot different than our other stores. Um, our parking lots in the Interna International District, you know, people aren't shopping, eating, going to the sports events. So those were down as well as, um, you know, we lease space to a number of restaurants and tenants and they also um, saw challenging times. So, you know, we're lucky we had a portfolio or we have a portfolio, but it's definitely been not one specific kind of response that we've seen um, to our operations, although across the board, it's just been hard on all employees, just, you know, the mental stress and kind of the, the impact of, um, of the pandemic. But to our operations, it's been a very different um, situation depending on which business it is and where it was located. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard estimates that only five to 10% of downtown workers are actually working downtown. And I think that, you know, one of the challenges for a lot of businesses that have downtown locations is it's going to be when do those workers come back? I mean, just having a vaccine and and having people feel physically safer might not bring everybody back because some people might be comfortable now working from home and they might be a little slower to maybe they come back for three days a week instead of instead of five. But with the lack of restaurants, with 100, as Sandy said, 140 restaurants and retail and, and other businesses permanently going out of business downtown, it really, that diminishes the attraction of coming back to work downtown when you might have to walk several blocks to find somewhere where you can buy some lunch. So, right. yeah. Great. Well, thank you. That was, Thanks. that was really, that was awesome. So thank you. Did you have something else you wanted to add? I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Denise. Uh, Tiffany, welcome. Um, and it's great to have, I, I actually live above a QFC, so <laughs> I, I feel really close to you right now uh, as I'm <laughs> sitting five floors above your uh, Ballard store. So, so oh, welcome wow. to, uh, to this panel. Wonderful. Well, going with QFC. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it has been quite the ride. So I'm the corporate affairs manager for the QFC division of Kroger. Um, we have 61 stores really from uh, Stanwood up near, kind of near Bellingham all the way down to Portland, Oregon. We've got some out on the peninsula and then we go as far east just in the foothills of the Cascades. So we've got like a North Bend and an Enumclaw location. But um, I would say the biggest, um, the biggest thing that has affected us really is our grocery store workers have become frontline workers, right? Um, you think of those, you know, 16 year old high school kids that get a job as a bagger at the grocery store. They're now frontline workers and they're being asked to, um, you know, enforce mask mandates and um, enforce social distancing. And so a lot of our grocery store associates have become, if you will, kind of these almost, um, you know, police officers in the stores trying to make sure that we're following all the mandates and all the new rules and, and make sure that we're adapting and adjusting and, and keeping our customers and our associates as safe as possible. So I think that's been one of the biggest um, changes that I've seen is just this change of who a grocery worker is. Um, you know, they go to work every day with the fear and the concern of you know, am I going to be exposed to someone with COVID-19? And um, so I would, I would let you know that um, a lot of our job, a lot of my job um, over the last eight plus months has been to make sure that our stores are as safe and clean and stocked as possible. And so making sure that, you know, within 48 hours, we had plexiglass up at all of our registers and that we had social distance decals down on the floor and and it took us, you know, several weeks to secure enough PPE, the, the masks and the gloves and everything for, you know, uh, QFC has over 6,000 associates right now. I think we're, we're even higher than that because we've been hiring, trying to fill, you know, the increase in business. 
Um, so really the biggest adjustment has been kind of that pivoting to um, adapt and make sure that our associates are safe and healthy and that our customers are safe and healthy and, and make sure that we're following all of the, the mandates that change, it feels like by the day right now. Right, exactly. It's, yeah, it, it has been hard and it, you know, people have certainly had to learn a whole different way of sanitizing um, and making, making their, their business space safe for their employees and their customers. You know, we've never worried about airborne issues before. Not that flu season is inconsequential, but we've never had mask mandates, <laughs> never had the sanitation requirements that, you know, you guys are dealing with today. So, um, yeah, so, you know, kudos to your, your frontline workers because they've kept us all fed and, and, uh, and you know, provisioned uh, to get through this pandemic, so. Well, Joan, um, we feel really fortunate to have you with us today too. And I think you have a study that you want to share some results of um, here that just has that you've just completed. So we're excited to to hear from you. Well, thank you, John, and thank you for including me on this panel. Good morning, everyone. Um, we are excited to share the insights from the Washington State University Carson College of Business Retail Report, and it was just released yesterday. Um, but a little background on this report is we have been serving Pacific Northwest consumers for the past four years, so since 2017. And this is, you know, our fourth annual report. We're excited about these results. And there are many other similar national surveys, but the Carson College felt that there was a need for information and insights related specifically to the PNW shopper. We survey a thousand consumers in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. And then we oversample. We survey an extra 750 consumers from urban areas. So including Seattle, Portland, um, Spokane, Coeur d'Alene. And so this year at a very high level, the summary of our insights, one COVID-19, as you all know very, very well, has had a significant impact on shopping. But what we're finding from this report is that not all of those effects are permanent. We also are finding that shoppers feel an increased responsibility to support local businesses during this pandemic. And, you know, holiday spirits are somewhat dampened because of the pandemic, but holiday shopping, we are finding, can be a much needed source of comfort and cheer. And so specifically, to, to drill down just a little bit more, over half of the shoppers indicated that they were anxious or fairly unenthusiastic about the holidays, and they don't really feel like celebrating, yet like 68% indicated shopping's a way to feel normal in a not very normal world. Many people were looking for a reason to celebrate. Um, and it, as I mentioned, some of the changes that COVID-19 has imposed on shoppers has also increased and strengthened their connection to local businesses and to the community. You know, no surprise, 91% said shopping's different now. But they also said, 71% in fact said shopping in store is actually important to help businesses stay open. And 77%, so these are large percentages, 77% indicated they feel safe shopping in store if the mask use is enforced. And to get, you know, and obviously those will, will um, vary by state and by region. I think we all know even in the state of Washington, probably Eastern Washington is somewhat different than Western Washington. But Seattle specifically, um, Seattle Metro consumers indicated that they're more likely to shop from a retailer if the retailer has an in-store and online presence that are well integrated. They are more likely to shop from a retailer if their employees and shoppers are required to wear a mask. And so these were percentages that were significantly higher than other areas that we, re that we surveyed. Um, and also, I think this is interesting, especially given the new um, 
mandates that we heard this week, 74%, even back in October, so we fielded this survey in mid-October, 74% of the Seattle Metro consumers indicated that they were going to avoid travel this, this holiday season. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to share, and, and there's a lot of information in this report, but lastly, enthusiasm for Black Friday is decreasing, and many plan to shop much earlier to avoid crowds for one thing, but also as we know, deals are available much earlier, but it's not even just Black Friday, 80%, 80 and this was overall, 80% indicated that they wish more stores would stay closed on Thanksgiving. And even interest in Cyber Monday, it was down 10 percentage points from last year. Interest in Cyber Monday is decreasing. So really high level, as I said, there's a lot to report and you can find this report on the WSU Carson College Business website. But just to wrap up, holiday shoppers are shopping earlier than ever. They're not as enthusiastic about shopping on those iconic holiday shopping days. They feel a strong commitment to local businesses. And it's really important to keep shoppers and employees super safe. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back. Um, as I said, there's a lot of insights, some very specific insights to the Seattle um, area. And so hopefully as we continue this conversation, I may have more of those specifics that, that you wanna hear. And John, you need to turn on your mute. There we go. Thank you. That, that's very helpful, John. Thank you for sharing. It, you know, it, the retail industry always needs additional information. And, and I know that we all appreciate the fact that, that you've done this research and this is the fourth year you've done it. And it's information is, you know, is extremely valuable to this industry as we try to keep up with what consumers want. And, you know, especially in this crazy year, um, that's going to be really helpful to a lot of a lot of member businesses of Washington Retail Association, as well as as grocers, as they try to meet the needs of customers over the holidays and moving forward. So for sure, it is a crazy year, and and hopefully these insights though do shed some hope on where we're going, and even during this pandemic, but certainly post pandemic, um, I, I think that. There, there's some real indication that shoppers want to go back to normal. Um, and what that means to them is the way it was before this pandemic. So uh, th they miss their in-store shopping. They still look at the in-store shopping as a source of inspiration. So um, I, I hope that, that that is a good indication, a, a positive thing during this time. That's great, thank you. You bet. So so to the other panelists, as, as we look ahead, um, do you see, obviously there are a lot of challenges with the pandemic, but do you see opportunities, um, opportunities for new growth that, that, um, that have perhaps been opened up um, because of what we have all been through over the last several months? Um, why don't we start with you, Tiffany? Any thoughts on, on how QFC sees business moving forward uh, for the remainder of the pandemic, but also post-pandemic. Yeah, I think I would agree with what Joan said about uh, shoppers really wanting an integrated online presence along with the in-person presence. And so I think for QFC, boy, back in March, we had just a handful of stores where we had um, the pickup option where you can order your groceries online and drive up to the curb and someone runs it out to you. We real quick adapted and launched it at almost all of our stores. We're not quite at all of our stores, but I mean, we tripled the number of stores that we offered that kind of that e-commerce solution for. And I will say that um, even now, eight months later, we have seen probably about a over a thousand percent increase in our orders. I know that back in June, I was talking to a store manager and he was telling me that usually before the pandemic, they'd have like, you know, five or six orders a week. And they were now seeing upwards of 30 to 40 orders a day. Um, of people that were choosing that online um, option. And so, you know, that's been an area that we've been hiring um, just, you know, hand over fist, trying to um, 
put, uh, you know, hire more positions to, to do that personal shopping where they run through the store, get the items and run it out to the person's car. That seems to be, so that would be my, my impression as we head into the future. I, I don't see that going away as if things were letting up as people were starting to feel more comfortable about a month ago or even two months ago, we still saw a lot of people choosing to use that online option. But that's, I would say kind of that online presence is key for a lot of businesses. And that makes a lot of sense. Like Zoom calls and Zoom webinars, they they will be they will stay with us in the future, even as we are able to move around more more freely. So, Denise, what about you? What are you seeing as we look ahead? Same, um, just as with with QFC, we launched curbside. Actually, we didn't have any stores doing curbside um, service before the pandemic, and within um, a few months, we launched it all four stores. And I think. Um, I definitely think that it will continue past the pandemic. I think one nice thing about kind of the fact that we had to do this so rapidly is just, you know, it's um, working for a grocery store that has a 92 year history and we have a lot of employees who've been with us for so long. You know, before when I had mentioned we should look at doing more delivery or this, and they were all like, oh, it's fine. You know, we don't really need this, but they really forced it. We've launched it, we've seen good growth. And so we're looking at more, you know, now, Besides curbside, you know, we do partner with Instacart for delivery, but what other channels can we do to um, promote delivery of our groceries or of our food, uh, hot food? And so I think it's really helped kind of force a mindset on some of our employees who are more resistant to some of these ideas before. And, you know, they've embraced it. And with it, I think we've, we have been um, able to reach some new customers or I think the stores that, um, you know, are enforcing masks, as Joan said, you know, we, if you can feel, if customers feel you're a trusted store and that you're you're really taking this seriously, they'll they'll pick you over a different store, perhaps um, driving you know a little bit further, knowing they'll be, feel safe. So, I think we will continue to um, try new technologies and which will help us um, reach new customers and make people feel comfortable. You know, Denise, I think you touched on a really important point, I, and I think that's something that. Washington Retail Association, my, my client's been really aware of is there are limitations on the number of customers you can have in your stores. And, and, and um, obviously, you know, spreading people out as they check out and all this. But the limitations also, um, I think, reflect public concern about their safety. And, and if and if people don't feel safe going into a retail setting or a grocery store, then you could be at 100% occupancy allowed and they're not going to show up. So, um, you know, I think retailers and grocers have just done a tremendous job of adapting to this situation and building public confidence that, that they can go out and, and do you know, essential shopping, but also, also buy jewelry and buy art and, and buy other things too that, that, um, that make their life better and, 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 you know, keep them connected to the previous life, <laughs> the pre-pandemic life. Sandy, what's, what do you see moving forward as, as we emerge from this pandemic? Well, I would speak to that whole thing about how careful we are and how important it is. I think uh, because I'm very small, you know, it's easier to um, maintain. And I think that's true for all small businesses, but we do provide masks. We do provide um, gloves. We have hand sanitizer and we take their temperature. We do the tracing because um, that is the thing that I'm comfortable with and it makes our customers comfortable. I think that a small, a very small business is more of a, a tighter community. So the people who come in are more aware of what you're doing and, re, and, and tell other people that they know. It's just, it's a slightly different way that it works. I think that um, going forward, it's really just depends on how that vaccine um, comes into play. However, in terms of that, what Joan was talking about, about the meshing of 
um, of uh, like online and in store. That is something that uh, I have done intensely because uh, my demographic is probably women who are 50 and older and um, they really are uh, loath to come in a lot of times. So for them being able to go online is really important. I also started doing Instagram um, on a regular basis, which makes me connected to my customer. I mean, that's what we're talking about here, staying connected to your customer in some form. And so I choose those forms because it's I'm small and it's very personal. And I will continue to do that, you know. At, I mean, today was day 236. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I- John, that, John if I could- Yeah, John, please join, join in there. You know, I think this is important for Seattle retailers because um, more so than in other regions, like half of the Seattle Metro consumers indicated that it was relatively easy to adjust to COVID shopping restrictions and that shopping online as well as in store makes them feel connected and like they're doing their part to help their local businesses during this time. So, you know, I think you have a consumer in the Seattle area who adapts to this situation, but who every bit as much as other parts of, of the PNW that we surveyed um, desire that, that um, commitment to their local businesses. So I, I think you're, you're in a good situation with the consumers as long as they feel safe. Mm -hmm. That's great. It's and I think I think that I I read recently that Seattle has the highest mask compliance use of any major city in America, and I I think fellow consumers also help consumers feel comfortable. I know I've gone into places, especially earlier on, where there weren't as many masks, and you know it's that's not as comfortable to to be there or to spend as much time or you know, do as much shopping as, as when there is a lot of, uh, of um, mask usage all around you, so. I think, John, also there is that factor to, however, of people being loath to come downtown because of all the things that have happened there, regardless of supporting their small business, regardless, regardless of how careful we all are, um, there are those factors that they don't want, you know, parking is still kind of a problem. Um, there are still lots and lots of homeless people. Um, the, it, and the core, and I'm not really in the core, but the core is still very boarded up. This makes it sad for people to come downtown. Um, the Pike Place Market, which I'm very near because it's open air, it has more a, a somewhat feeling of normalcy. And that's what we have to be able to try to shoot for, right? Some feeling of normalcy because it doesn't feel like that now. Well, thank you, Sandy. You, you really segue to my next question, which is the challenges. And your challenge is the state of downtown and how that impacts your ability to draw customers to your store. What about you, Denise? Um, is there a challenge beyond sort of the safety, the obvious safety measures that, that you've encountered, maybe in your supply chain or keeping toilet paper in stock or? <laughs> sure, I mean, there's some supply chain kind of kinks, I think, but ne you know, no, we're never gonna not have any food. So, you know, you may have to choose a different brand or something like that. So it's a, a little hiccup. I think the bigger challenge, and I think Tiffany alluded it to a little bit, is um, the safety, but beyond the safety is the mental kind of like um, emotional and mental health of, of the employees. It is stressful going in every day and thinking I could, I'm, could potentially be exposed. Um, and, and we do have really good mask compliance in Washington and Seattle, but there are certain, you know, there's always those customers that don't want to comply and they're not going to do it quietly. They want to, you know, talk to your manager and get in a fight with you about it or tell you how, you know, you're not, 
this ADA and they're, you're really out of compliance, we're gonna sue you, you know, and it's, it's tough. And you know, Tiffany said a lot of times it's a 16 year old or even if it's someone who's been working at our store a long time, it's still stressful and hard. And um, so I think our employees do feel safe, but it's just the, the stress um, every day kind of that, that takes a toll. And the other challenge that we're kind of trying to figure out how to work through it is cold season comes and, um, you know, the this list of symptoms is headache and, you know, fatigue and muscle aches. And so it's like trying, you want everyone to be safe. And if they have any of those symptoms to not work, but then if the employee, you know, doesn't work or they burn through their, their sick time, then they have to choose you know, do I not go to work and then I may not get paid. And so we're trying to figure out how do we make it safe for employees to, they have those symptoms to um, stay home, but then not make it too easy that you can just say, oh, I have a headache, I'm not gonna work, but still pay me. So that's kind of another challenge that we're, you know, it's, it's hard to figure out that right balance and keeping everyone safe and their mental health safe um, while, you know, running a store and recognizing sometimes symptoms may just, be, I mean, everyone has headaches every, you know, every once in a while, right? So it's kind of that finding that balance is another thing, having the managers make those calls and really having that communication and trust with employees that they feel comfortable to um, speak up and, you know, really share that they have, they're not feeling well and, and then being able to um, have them find a solution that works for, for both the company and for them. Yeah, the, 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 long list of symptoms for COVID-19. I mean, pretty much, you know, we all have something at some point during the week that that is on that list. Um, right. And it's, uh, it doesn't make it any easier to self-diagnose and figure out how to, how to take, or to what extent you have to really take care of yourself or to what extent you, you know, you need to just continue on with life and not worry about the sniffles or the headache or whatever, but. Yeah. Um, Tiffany, what about you? Any um, any challenge that we haven't touched on yet that you guys are dealing with with QFC? Yeah, I, I think Denise brings up some great points. I think um, it's just been a lot for our associates to handle. Like, I, let alone just you know the government policies that change on a weekly, if not a daily basis, and and trying to make sure that we're following all those new rules and. Um, and then, um, yeah, like, I don't know if you've noticed, but grocery store workers have on some occasions, they're being called heroes and they're being called, they're just wonderful and they're amazing. And then the next day they're being vilified because they, you know, made someone put on a mask or they confronted someone about something. And um, it's just, so it's been exhausting. I think Denise used that word. It's been exhausting for, for a lot of the associates. And and not only have they had to handle COVID-19, but we've had to handle, um, you know, there's been some riots and there's been some, especially we've got a store, you know, that was a, a block away from CHOP or I, I can't remember what it was officially called, but, um, you know, windows were being smashed in. We had associates that, you know, had things thrown at them. And um, we've had other groups, you know, these other, you know, people that want to, to um, you know, they want to express their right to not have to wear a mask. And, so they'll they'll come into a store as a group with bullhorns and 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 they'll take over the store and be shouting things at people and um, confronting people. And, I mean, it's just and then you know you think we have the coin shortage and we've got problem with the paper bag shortage and we've got. I mean, there has been a lot to handle over the last eight months, and it hasn't just been COVID nineteen. There have been a lot of things heaped on there as well, and so um, I think there's really been some exhaustion of, um, you know, how, how do we rejuvenate and how do we feel good again, you know, because we don't see an end in sight. We're hopeful that there will be a, you know, a um, vaccine in a few months here and, and that people will start to, to get vaccinated. But I think, yeah, it's, it's really exploring how can we feed into our employees and help them feel rejuvenated and feel refreshed and, and feel supported and encouraged because um, it's a lot for them to handle. So that's, I think, been the biggest, the biggest challenge is, um, is finding out how we can encourage and support. And, and we put a lot of money into that. I have to say Kroger has, has really put a lot of money into that where, you know, we've, we've 
we've set up a fund to to help pay associates who maybe have used up all their sick, sick time or they've got a spouse that has come down with it and so they need to be home to care for family or um so above and beyond what their paid time off is we you know we're trying to find ways to make sure that nobody has to come to work you know has to make that decision whether caring for a family member or come to work and but it's yeah it's it's been a lot and people think that you know grocery stores have been making all this money and and but i'll tell you Kroger's put six billion dollars back into health and safety and um you know bonuses and and supplies and um so it's it's been a lot I, it's been a and I think whether you're big or small, it's been affecting everyone quite a bit. Well, then you um, you segued into my next question. So thank you, Tiffany. You guys are a great panel. You lead me into the next question each time. Um, and that is, you mentioned the marches, and I think the other big issue that we've that we've been dealing with as a nation and a community over the last several months has been has been equity and access to opportunity for BIPOC communities and, um, and just racial justice. And, and how do you, how, how are your businesses dealing with that? You know, what kinds of changes do you see, you know, your businesses making to, to broaden that access to opportunity and, and equity? So Tiffany, do you want to start since you kind of kicked it off there? The yeah, morning? yeah. Yeah, you know, I think George Floyd changed the world. He tragedy and horrible what happened to him, but he has changed the world and it has woken up a lot of people. And I think um, for, for us, for my industry, for Kroger and QFC, we spent several months doing listening sessions where we sat down with people of color in our business and just sat around a table and listened. What do we need to do? What do we need to change? What is frustrating? What is... Um, how can we be a better ally? And so we spent several months doing that. And we just recently um, implemented some changes and um, you know, putting some new things into effect. I know for QFC, we now have an African-American associate resource group where um, they're meeting on a bi-weekly basis or every two weeks. Is that bi-weekly? I always get confused if bi-weekly is twice a week or every two weeks. Um, and coming up with ideas and tangible ways that we can do a better job. What do we need to change? What do we need to, to do to be more inclusive and um, to be a better ally? And so, yeah, I think that it's, it's been an interesting year um, seeing people's eyes opened and seeing um, changes happening that need to happen. Um, so, so that's what I see happening within, within my company. Great, thank you. Uh, Denise. Well, thanks, John. That's a that's a good question. I think you know one we've just had some initial conversations around what does um, diversity, inclusion, and belonging really look like and feel like at our company. <clears throat> we um, being primarily an Asian grocery store, you know, we do have a number of um, immigrants and Asian population um, employees. And, you know, but we know there that's there's a lot more diversity than just that. And so um, I, I would say we've started to have conversations. We haven't um, put, you know, big task force or groups together. You know, I think a lot of it's just, we're just trying to get through the day to day, but it's really focusing on just how do we make our whole company um, more inclusive of all employees and, um, which is a conversation we've started to have, and there's definitely more work to be done. Great, thank you. Um, Sandy, um, any thoughts you wanna add on this, on this question? Well, I think aside from being very excited that it has caused us as a nation to look at what has become the norm in our country regarding um, racism. I think those discussions are just really important and wonderful. I, um, I'm so small, you know, I could have the diversity conversation with myself and my, you know, um, and in a weird way, Sandy Lou is kind of a diverse little spot because um, the women that I know and that are part of the, 
what I consider friends of Sandy Lou are a pretty diverse lot. Mm -hmm. um, we don't really have that many men, but you know, I think that it's really more where we put our um, charitable dollars. And um, when I and when I close the store, I don't close the store because I'm afraid I close the store because we joined something. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really on the small level. That's that's what we can do. It, you know, it, it's just a little bit different, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Great. Joan, do you have a do you have something you want to add, to add here? To add to this conversation, we did ask a related question. And going back to Seattle Metro consumers, they're more likely to shop at a retailer who supports Black Lives Matter or other social equity movements. And 51% indicated that that was the case. And that too was different than in some other parts of the Pacific Northwest that we surveyed. That's great, thank you. Um, we're gonna turn it over now to any questions that we have from um, our participants. Um, if you have any, please type them into the Q&A box and Lee and I will um, will respond to those as they come in and share them with the panel to, to discuss. Um, while we wait for questions, one thing I touched on early on in, in my uh, opening comments was that, that a lot of retailers and grocers have challenges with public safety. And, you know, that's, that's, that was a pre-pandemic issue and it'll be a post-pandemic issue. And it's certainly an issue now during the pandemic. Um, Denise, any, any thoughts about how that's affecting Wajamai and how you do business and how you respond to it? Um, I mean, I, I think it's, as you mentioned, it was a challenge before the pandemic. And I think the, the pandemic does make it, you know, kind of makes it even more, more of a challenge. Um, a lot of people that they may not have the resources that they had before. And so, um, gosh, I don't really um, have much else to say other than, you know, I think it's just still a, a, something that um, we haven't quite figured out. And I think city council still hasn't quite shown kind of um, demonstrated a real commitment to, um, well, I haven't quite seen the leadership that maybe we need in this city to um, address it. And I think the pandemic has just made things even harder. So I guess I don't really know if I'm answering it or if I have the, um, have the question right, but it's, it's definitely still um, there. And um, unfortunately, probably in some areas getting even worse. And um, to Denise and Tiffany, do, do either of you guys have, do, do your companies hire security guards at a more, at more stores or more locations or for more hours of the day than, than maybe you did two years ago? Have you seen that kind of a need increase over the last, last couple of years? Denise, why don't you start and then we'll go to Tiffany. Sure. Um, definitely over the last few years, I but not necessarily due to the pandemic. And actually at some of our stores, the fact that we're at the front monitoring entry and asking for mask compliance that some people that may have just kind of wandered into the store before, um, you know, they're they're not, they're choosing not to come in or if, you know, they're asked to wear a mask, they kind of um, say no and they, they leave. And so I would say we have definitely hired more, we have more security hours um, over the last two years, but not necessarily because of the pandemic. Okay. Tiffany, what about with QFC? Yeah, so so we contract through a third party company for security at many of our stores. And it's, it's I would say the same as what Denise mentioned. Um, it's um, been going on long before the pandemic. Um, and we have had to increase, uh, especially when we hear of 
you know, protests that are planned for a specific, like maybe downtown Bellevue, where we've been seeing quite a few, um, you know, we, we learned that one the hard way because one of our stores did get, um, you know, taken over and, and boy, it was, it was a mess in there afterwards. Um, so yes, security has been um, increasing as we, you know, try to keep customers and associates safe and, and while also protecting our stores. Um, yeah, that's a common theme for quite a while now. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And we have our first few questions now from our participants. Um, James writes, a significant, a, a pretty significant decline in mobility is projected from mid-December into March, near to where we were last April. What have we learned and what will you do different? Uh, do you wanna start Tiffany and we'll move down the panel? Yeah, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. So a change in mobility, meaning not being able to get out of the house or- Probably, yeah, people are gonna, it's gonna be more like the shutdown that we had early on in the pandemic. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think we will continue to do what we're doing is offering, you know, several options. People can order online either through Instacart with delivery or through pickup, curbside pickup um, through our e-commerce option. Um, I think that we, you know, we have seen that that's going to stick around. It's not going anywhere. Um, people are liking that option. They feel better about that option. So we'll continue to do that. Great. Um, Denise? Same. Denise? the curbside, the delivery, I think we've gotten a little bit smarter in um, having a little bit, so the key items that we know are hot, the rice and, you know, the paper towels, just trying to have those bigger supply in our warehouse. And so I think um, just we've learned a little bit about which items are going to be the ones that people panic by and, and try to have more of a stock. Um, so that, I guess that's one thing we've learned. Um, and then I think hopefully Customers have also learned that, you know, grocery stores aren't going to close and food's not going to go off the shelf. So hopefully um, from the customer perspective, there's been some learning too. So we don't see as much panic buying. Great. Um, Sandy, you have a different kind of shopping experience for your customers. Um, people probably want to see and touch what they, what they buy from you. How, how do you deal with reduced movement um, of people around the city over the next few months? Well, we do a lot of things that we, we've moved more into sending things to people that we have some association with already in what we call a, approval. Then they can try it. They can see, you know, they, we send it to them. We drop it off to them. Um, I think, uh, it, there's been sort of a switch to about what we are seeing people really like to have because nobody's going up. You know, that's the mantra, right? I'm not going anywhere. I don't need anything. So, um, but you are in your house and it is fun to feel good in your house. So, you know, I, I've sort of switched to a lot of things that are more comfortable and um, easier to wear. Um, and I think my industry has done that to some extent as well. But I think that in terms of people not being able to come to the store, we try to make it as easy as we can for them to receive something without actually, actually leaving their house. Great. So we have another question here from Shannon. How have you handled issues of non-mask wearers and security and safety issues um, surrounding protests? Um, we've touched on that a little bit, but but um, if people have more to add, that would be that would be great. Um, Denise or Tiffany, do you have any anything you want to add on this? I know one of the tricks about about the whole mask wearing enforcement issue is that, you know, except for your security personnel, you don't normally want to have retail employees confront customers in, you know, bar them from coming in or bar them from leaving, even if they're shoplifting or whatever, because the safety of your, of your employees comes first. So, but but the state has really put it on your shoulders and on the shoulders of your employees 
to enforce the statewide mask mandate? How do you strike that balance? You know, that's such a good thing to discuss because, um, you know, there's this thing called the ADA, right? The American with Disability Act. And so you can't, you, you, you can't refuse service to someone who has a medical condition and can't wear a mask. And you really can't even ask if what their medical condition is or you can't do that. So, so we're really put in this tough place where we can't deny service to people and we don't want to, we want people to have access to food, but we also want to keep people safe and healthy. And, and we've seen in our stores, you know, there have been all out knockdown fights over someone not wearing a mask and um, it, it escalates quickly, like within seconds. You know, we've had store managers who have approached someone and, and we ask that our store managers approach someone who doesn't wear a mask and gently ask them if they need a mask. Um, but we've had store managers get thrown to the ground, get punched, have shopping carts pushed into them. Um, it's, it's a rough spot to be in. And, and I understand why the governor does it. It says that we need to enforce this and we need to require this because we want to get this pandemic under control. But boy, it puts our people in a really rough spot because um, our hands are tied. We can't refuse service because you know we will have a lawsuit and the ADA will win those lawsuits. <laughs> um, it's just a hard, it's a hard place to be and a hard road to navigate. Denise, any additional thoughts on this? I know it's, it's tricky for all retailers. Yeah, nothing to add. I mean, we did put our security guards, um, we do have them at our Seattle store kind of being the ones enforcing now because it was hard for our employees. And I think, you know, having someone in a uniform sometimes makes it a little bit less likely, although people do still try to get in little altercations with them. But we just found that kind of they, they have a better success rate of kind of, um, having people either um, come back with a mask or, or put one on, but um, agree with everything Tiffany said. Well, I know that when the mask mandate first came out, that, that violation of the mask mandate fell upon the store, that, that you, know, you, you were required to deny service to, to prevent somebody from either entering your store or checking out without a mask on, even if they're doing self-checkout. Um, and that there was a fine, you know, associated with that. I have not heard of any stores actually being fined, but um, but it certainly added a sense of of tension to the whole thing about how how do we enforce this mandate safely, um, you know, without violating people's rights and causing encouraging fights, you know, among customers or people attacking store personnel. So. Um, okay, we have another question here. Aside from offering new delivery options, have there been other surprising or unexpected innovations to your business operations during the pandemic? And this is from Eric. I'm going to just jump in and say the surprising thing to me was the whole um, obsession with toilet paper. <laughs> I just never saw that coming. And I, and I'm, I'm shocked it's happening again this week. Um, I don't know what it is about toilet paper that people feel like they need to have a hundred rolls um, for a two week shutdown, but, um, or a four week shutdown. Um, but I, I would say that's been really surprising to me. Some of the items that people really feel they have to have <laughs> in their home. Um, yeah. Toilet paper and peanut butter have been the two that I've observed that <laughs> fly off the shelf. Uh, Denise? I was going to say, I don't, there nothing like groundbreaking innovations, but I know we've just had to rethink how we do things um, like our anniversary sale that we celebrate every October. Usually we have in-store events and, um, you know, this year we did a virtual cooking demonstration, which we've never done before. And we had to figure out how to do it. And I think before pandemic, there probably wouldn't have been that much interest in things like that, but we had over a hundred people join us for this virtu virtual cooking demo that we had with a local chef. Um, we just completed the remodel of our Seattle store and typically we'd have, you know, again, more in-person events. We couldn't do that. So we've, we're putting together a video, but we've really had to think differently of how can we engage with customers and our employees in a safe way with, by not bringing people together. Um, there's been some innovation around, you know, do we do Thanksgiving meals prepared 
put together. And, you know, I would have loved to do that before the pandemic. There was never really that drive, but now people are like, okay, you know, I think this is something that would, people would be interested. So it's, it is little things that we're thinking of differently, um, just how we engage or serve our customer in this, this day. So it's not groundbreaking technology, but I like that it's forced our teams um, to think differently. Great. Sandy, any, any additional thoughts on this? Yeah, in a similar way to what Denise was saying, um, you know, over the course of the 12 years, we developed kind of a rhythm to the store, a rhythm to the events. You know, people got used to it. We're going to have this, this happens in March. In March, that's usually when I have kind of a big um, annual birthday party for the store. Um, and um, we didn't have it. And we told that we weren't going to have it. And we just said, you know, this year is really different because we didn't really know how different it was going to be. So like, and similarly, like right now, I normally have a thing um, from my old studio called Gur Dog, which is the Gur Dog event at the store. But instead of doing it in the store where it's a big party and a lot of food, we're just offering other kinds of incentives for people you know, to buy things. And um, I think that's what we all have to do now. I think I wanted to speak to that safety issue thing. Mm -hmm. When you're small, you know, I am teeny, <laughs> but there are a lot of others like me. My front door is locked. My front door is locked all the time. We have had a couple of times where um, people from out of the state wanted to come in with no mask. And they say, you know, they didn't want to come in with a mask. So we show them the mask that we'll give them. And if they're willing, then they come in. But that locked door is our safety net now, you know, mm -hmm. which is kind of odd. I never thought that would be the case, but um, it makes us feel very safe. It makes my employees feel very safe. That's great. Well, we have a we have a we have a question here from Andy um, that uh, that takes us in a slightly different direction. I, I thank you, Andy. Um, what are three things that the Seattle City Council could do to both heal and promote a vibrant business culture? So, um, Sandy, do you want to kick us off on some thoughts about what Seattle? You're confronting the downtown issues, which maybe doesn't get a lot of attention um, from the Seattle City Council. Share your thoughts with us. Well, I think that um, parking and um, traffic movement is always a problem for downtown. You know, they, they um, were so excited. They were gonna make Third Avenue this thoroughfare and all the other streets were gonna become more uh, available to pedestrians and walking and shopping. Well, that really is not the case. Um, and they, the way on First Avenue parking is, is very, very difficult. Um, there are certain times when you can and cannot park. And when you're there and you're not supposed to be there, you get towed away and tourists, and that's Pike Place Market, right, are constantly being towed away. We, we run out there all the time and say, uh, 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 don't park here now, you know. Um, I think that the city council, it would be great if the city council kind of started to, in some way, work with the Department of Transportation. I know these are two very um, unique groups, but it would be great if they could learn to work together and make nice for downtown. I also think that the whole idea about uh, the Metropolitan Improvement District, which is uh, run by the DSA and helps out. We use them, we don't call the police anymore because the police don't come. But if you call the Metropolitan Improvement District, they will come and they will help you with somebody who's decided to shoot up in your doorway or to sleep in your doorway. They will come and they will help you and they'll talk help talk the person out of it. I think these are things that the um, city council needs to look at and adopt because um, they're alternatives and they, I think they nod to the, 
not defunding the police, but using that money in other positive ways that help business and the people downtown. Great, thank you. Denise, any thoughts on what the city council could do to improve the business culture here in Seattle? Right, well, I think Sandy just talked about it, public safety, I think the, until we get the perception back that downtown is a safe place to bring your family, safe place to visit from out of town, safe place to hold your convention, go shopping, whatever it is, um, it's a real challenge. And I, I hate mentioning problems that I, you know, I always want to find the solution. And this one is so complex um, that I hate when I bring it up because I don't have the answer, but it's just, I really feel that until we um, address mental health, addiction, and, you know, homeless, that it's really hard for downtown to get to be that vibrant place that we all want it to be. And so, again, I don't know what the right answer is, how we solve that, but I think we need to take stronger steps to address it. And, you know, I, I'm not sure what the latest on there was the proposal to, if there's any, um, you know, minor felonies, it just kind of gets thrown out. Those, those things, I feel I, they don't really work towards making downtown a safer place. And, and um, so again, I don't have the solution, but I just know that until everyone feels safe, um, it's, it can't be a vibrant place. Yeah, and, and, and just so everyone knows um, what Denise is referencing is there's a, a proposal that uh, the council is, is, I think, going to start to talk about more seriously after they finish up the budget um, in the next week or so um, that would broaden the ability to use substance abuse, mental illness, and poverty as defenses against um, misdemeanor uh, 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 prosecutions. And it essentially, it, it does not decriminalize, you know, theft and other things, but it would, one, probably discourage the police from doing any enforcement of that. Um, and two, those that do go into court, it would be a very broad door through which a defendant could potentially walk um, by just claiming one of those three defenses. So it, it broadens the ability to assert those defenses. So uh, Tiffany, any, any additional thoughts about what the city could do to improve the business climate? I don't think I have anything else to add from what they've already said. I think obviously safety is, is key and, and making customers and associates feel safe when they're, they're entering our stores or you know driving to, walking to our stores. Um, and I just would like to see more of a relationship built, I think, between the business community and the, the city council. I think um, that would go a long way to help speak to some of the issues that are going on and, and, and um, exploring some solutions. Great. Um, well, I think we have reached the end of our time. And um, I wanna first thank all of the panelists. You were tremendous. Um, and really share, I appreciate your willingness to share your insights and your perspectives on, you know, what you're seeing as you try to do business here in Seattle. I also want to make sure I don't forget to thank the sponsors for this event and to thank the chamber. So, um, so our sponsors include um, insurance and uh, benefits uh, solutions and, um, and Business Health Trust and Bank of America. Um, those three have, have helped bring this event to us today and we sincerely appreciate your support for this event. I think one, what we really heard today was that retailers are, are being incredibly resilient and innovative as they deal with this unfolding challenge that we all have with the pandemic. And, you know, there were many, as I said at the start, there were many challenges to doing business in Seattle before the pandemic was layered on top of it, but, um, but they've all become experts and their employees, their frontline employees have all become experts in keeping themselves and us safe as we, as we all 
you know, carry on our lives and survive, you know, seek to survive this, this, uh, this really challenging period. So, um, you know, thanks to all of you and the leadership that you bring to your businesses and, um, and thanks to the entire grocery and retail sector for, um, for all the investment and the time and the care that, that you bring to um, keep our community safe and nourished and, um, and provided with the things that we need for life. So um, thank you so much. Thank you to the participants for joining us today. Um, and uh, we look forward to maybe doing this some, at some time in the future. So thanks to everybody.